So that's kind of, go ahead. Yeah, it sounds like, my, it sounds like my a good question. My concern is this, though, that aren't we running the risk of sort of anthropomorphizing them in, in a way? Uh, because, I mean, I can see how, for example, a dog that has lost both of its hind legs uh, and then gets like a two-wheeled sort of a wheelchair prosthesis uh, benefits clearly from it. And, and I would uh, venture to say that we don't require the dog's explicit consent to do that because mm -hmm. we're clearly alleviating suffering if right. we provide it with such a prosthesis. Or a dolphin which has lost its flipper gets a flipper prosthesis, right? But I think we don't have the consent to sort of provide them with a cognitive uh, enhancement or, or a neural implant which would take them to our present level of intelligence. Uh, because at that moment, first, they didn't give us their explicit consent, but secondly, I don't have an answer to the question as to whether they're better off or worse off than they were before. I don't know. Yeah, and again, these are, these are exact questions that I that I tackle with on a regular basis, and I, there's a couple of angles that I've that I approach this with, and one is uh, using the uh, uh, the frameworks as established by the uh, the sociologist uh, John Rawls, and he had he kind of did this thought experiment uh, that re was referred to as the blind veil experiment, where in terms of um, uh, meeting out a, a great distribution of you know primary goods and and maximizing social justice. He said that uh, you basically need to. Uh, the way he the way he set up the experiment was that you sh you should put people take all of society, and or at least a set group of society and kind of put them behind what's called this this veil of knowledge where they don't know what their station is in life. They don't know if they're rich. They don't know if they're middle class or uh, disabled. They don't know they don't know anything about their situation in life. And then they're to ask them, okay, uh, what would be you know. The, the most kind of the most reasonable or, or the, um, uh, the the least I guess um, uh, desirable state to be in that society and he said that if you did this collectively you'd end up with you know the maximizing a kind of sense of social justice and I, I figured that knowledge of one species should probably also be included uh, in this kind of thought experiment that you know if you were if you were to uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, enter into this uh, into this thought experiment, and then at the end of it, you were told, "Well, actually, you're going to be you no. Know, you're actually you you in society are incarnated as uh, as an elephant. You know, how would you how would you feel about that, knowing that you could have been a human, for example? So the, the kind of que the, the question that I that I have here is like, if, if you knew in advance, uh, you know, what you could have been, what would you have chosen? And I think that maybe a grade eight would have actually chosen to be human. I don't know, uh, but that's one way that I've that I've chosen to kind of think this through and maybe you're getting a sense of a, in other words this is a way of inferring applied consent to a certain degree another way of going about it is uh, what I've called uplift sampling so let's say we take a chimpanzee and we give it uh, incrementally um, more uh, uh, more of a cognitive capacity to the point where it can actually articulate its desires and we would say do you like where this is going because you remember what it was like to be an unenhanced ape you know, it sounds it sounds pretty extreme, but um, basically ask it at that point and say, you know, is this an experiment worth continuing? Uh, were you happier back then? Uh, you know, in, in a way, in a way, almost asking them to be a spokesperson for their species, and maybe not necessarily one chip specifically, but we would sample across maybe several, uh, many, maybe, I don't know how many we could do this, but this would give us a sense as to whether or not you know what you're saying is exactly right. And just as an aside, by the way. Uh, and, and this speaks particularly well, I think, to the issue at hand and why, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat, in, well, why I am in support of it. Um, I'm sure you saw the, the Rise of the Planet of the Apes film last year. Yeah, yeah I did. And it, uh, to me, it's, I was so excited by it because it actually, it actually posed a very um, optimistic view or even a, a, a very enlightened view of enhancement, particularly animal enhancement, mm -hmm. because you had... You had this one, this one chimpanzee, the uh, the Caesar character, our protagonist, who uh, was forced to go back to this kind of natural state. Right, he was sent back to the sanctuary uh, be because he was misbehaving in society. And so now you had this this ape that had been raised as a human, had pretty much human level capacity, and was now forced to go back to a, this primitive sort of life. But most importantly, in and amongst those who are unuplifted, so basically, you know, regular, uh, tri you know, chimpanzees, and it was hell for him. He was 
he was brutalized there. He was bored out of his mind. It was in a way this kind of like a, um, a tremendous kind of step back for him. And uh, what it ended, up, what the movie ended up showing after that was okay. What 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 did he see as being kind of the solution out of this? You know, it was using his head, and in fact, it was uplifting his comrades around him. And it was really what it was was uh, a, a, a showing that it was. It was enhancement and intelligence as a liberatory force. That it was through, uh, you know, in being able to better engage, co- you know, in 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 their environment and uh, having the smarts to kind of get out of their situation that they could achieve their ends. In this case, get the hell out of that sanctuary and go and ex- basically go back to the forest or wherever it was, just so that they could be free and do what it is that they wanted to do. And to me, that was unbelievable, uh, an unbelievable kind of message that was put in there by the writers and. Maybe I'm giving them more credit than they, they than they deserve, but I, I think not. I think it was a very uh, deliberate attempt to show this. So, uh, in this sense, what it can uh, to kind of maybe taking from this movie and applying it to the uplift uh, ideas that I put forward is it, I think, and this even even harkens a bit to uh, James Hughes's idea of democratic transhumanism, which is basically the idea that it's through enhanced humans that we can enhance the democratic process and become more. Uh, that the that the polit the politic, if you will, and we as citizens can better engage in the issues, can improve d- democratic institutions and I- other kinds of institutions that are all in our collective best interest. Because right now, arguably, the problem with democracy is that we have an electorate that's largely uninformed. They're victims of their own cognitive biases, victims of uh, or you know their the, the class not victims, but their 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 voting patterns are subject to their social uh, place in life and and so on. That it's not necessarily, uh, let's say, optimized uh, from a, the, the way democracies should work. So enhancement can also be looked at, particularly animal enhancement, as a way to politicize animals, to give them the means with which they can better govern themselves. And I know this is obviously a very controversial idea because the idea here is that they're that just out of the state of nature that they're happy, that they like you know hanging out in the jungle and eating the the grass, and that's that's as good as it gets, and maybe we're the ones that are messed up, and that it's modern society that's completely a, a disaster. And, uh, you know, these are hard questions, And uh, but ultimately, I think, you know, would we would we want to go back to the plains and, uh, you know, be uh, be you know, ravaged by uh, by nature and not have, you know, these kinds of technological endowments that we've come to know and love, everything from immunizations through to Band-Aids and surgery and anesthesia? Um, but even just knowing that we're protected by institutions and protected by rights and freedoms, that uh, that why shouldn't uh, we give an- animals, particularly let's say the the ones that I've talked about in the personhood program, at least give them this these uplifts, such that they can again better govern themselves and become democratized and politicized. Mm-hmm. So, George, um, one of the sort of major takeaway points that I had from our first interview with you was um, the thought that mass extinction is the simplest explanation for why we are seeing an uncolonized galaxy. Um, And the other thing was that uh, during our first interview, when I asked you about uh, our chances of survival, I think the the reply that you gave gave was almost nil. So uh, first of all, I want to ask you if the the number has changed since our last conversation, uh, and if if it has, why? And second, uh, I'd ask you to elaborate on that whole idea. Yeah, I'm thinking. Um... I still think it's pretty close to nil, unfortunately, but that that hasn't stopped me. I kind of like my mission now as a as a SETI studier and uh, as somebody who's looking at, for example, uh, these the, the kind of the uh, visions of the deep future as to where we could end up. I'm desperately looking for uh, you know a theory or some kind of a solution that will change my mind. Uh, that's a, that's a, I'm looking for these kind of glimmers of optimism. But I have to be honest with you. I mean, I, I'm I'm gravely pessimistic and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm at the risk of repeating what we had said in the last interview, it's simply the, the, the logistical challenge of juggling uh, not just one you know, apocalyptic risk, but multiple apocalyptic risks, everything ranging from the ongoing struggle to manage our, our, our nuclear arsenal through to some pending technologies such as molecular nanotechnology, and specifically the, the weaponized molecular nanotechnology, and even things like uh, weaponizing artificial intelligence or an, an AI gone simply horribly wrong in terms of uh, its first uh, or ultimate instanti- instantiation. 
and there's other ones we probably don't even know about. And uh, how we can possibly uh, collectively manage all this is beyond me. And I think it may uh, it, it provides, unfortunately, an elegant solution to the to the Fermi paradox that it's this this great filter, if you will, that uh, that no civilization can really surpass, and that it eventually just ends up imploding in on itself and uh, and gets snuffed out before it can actually you know do anything uh, from a cosmological or an intergalactic perspective. So um, now that said, um, I'm still very much interested, like I said, in other possible escape hatches, and uh, that's you know one thing that excites me to a certain degree about the whole singularitarian aspect is that perhaps it's through that particular avenue that we'll get our act together and that we'll be able to find a kind of mode of, an ex mode of, an, of existence that will allow us to continue into the future. What I refer to as a kind of um, adaptationist, uh, uh, you know, end game, if you will, that we will, it might be a narrow area in terms of an escape hatch, but it'll be still, it'll, even in, in its adaptationism, it will allow us to f continue into the future and what that might actually be, who's to say. Um, it may very well be, for example, um, you know, this kind of, uh, migration into smaller space that what when jo what John Smart refers to as messed space and that we will we just simply will be looking that space is going to be in our rear view mirror and we have no interest in colonizing the galaxy because there's going to be so much more to do let's say in massive supercomputers uh, which is why therefore perhaps the uh, the ultimate end state for a civilization is simply the construction uh, of massive supercomputers uh, like G uh, Jupiter brains or Matryoshka brains and so on. And that if you do the number crunching, you can see that uh, you can quite literally create universes within universes within such, uh, such massive structures. Uh, the, the, the key, of course, will be to continue to power computation and to deal with the residual effects of computation such as uh, heat dissipation and so on. Uh, but there's even already models in place. I spoke with uh, Stephen Wolfram at a conference uh, last year who explained to me that there are already models out there for... Um, uh, the zero uh, uh, heat dissipated uh, computational models, which is very exciting to hear. But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, for all we know, for example, we are currently dwelling within what's really kind of like a tic-tac-toe universe. And uh, we think, we in our, our small paleo brains think it's, it's, it's pretty badass and pretty complex. But until we create that chess universe... Uh, we ha we don't really know what uh, you know what what could, what are the possibilities. So for there could be uh, you know adding adding for example a dimension to our experience might be exponential in terms of what it does to our interests, our activities, and the spaces with we wish to explore, albeit albeit in a digital sort of a space. So um, I, I what I'll say to you while I while I feel that you know extinction is still the likely scenario, um, I will not sit here and tell you that there aren't other possibilities is that at least there's a bit of that kind of like hope at the end of the the tragic story uh, that uh, and, and that, that this is potentially an area worth exploring which is why I keep wanting to go into that that area to say yes you know actually maybe we can explain 